to suggest that you probably shouldn't expose constructors as part of the public API of your Java classes, or indeed in languages that share a particular feature with it. Instead, you should probably provide a factory or a builder, or some pattern of that sort. Notice that modern core Java APIs tend not to provide Java constructors. So the question is, why not? Well, the observation is that if you call a constructor, one of only two things will be the outcome. You'll either get a brand new object of the exact specified type, or you'll get an exception. Now that can be a problem because you might decide that you would like to benefit from pooling if you have immutable data types and you have a lot of duplicates, you could save a lot of memory that way. You might also suddenly discover later on that you want to create specialized subtypes of this type. And if you have that situation, then your calling code is going to have to decide which of the types it should create. And it's probably not the caller's responsibility to make that decision. In some cases, it will be. Also, constructors are limited by the rules of overloading. That is to say that multiple constructors for initializing from different raw materials must have argument type sequences that differ. Now, just to be clear, a class must have a constructor if you're planning to instantiate it. Also, if you have any final fields, they must be fully initialized by the time the constructor sequence completes. The point here is whether a constructor is accessible outside of the class. So why might you care? Well, I have a long-standing guidance in design that says you should aim to minimize the consequences of change. Of course, the hard part is always guessing what changes might happen and also not digging yourself into a giant Yagni problem. That's to say, the code, the code you write where you ain't gonna need it. So, what's the story? First, your initial requirements suggest that there's only going to be one type for some business domain class, and you haven't thought about whether pooling might or might not be useful, or you're not into immutable data, therefore it probably won't be. You write your class and you publish it with your constructor. Over time, your client code accumulates many constructor calls in many files. But then, if you want to change to a factory, enforcing the use of that factory, you've got a lot of changes to make. All of the constructor calls need to become calls to the factory. And even if you have a mechanical refactoring, these changes might cause merge conflicts. So yes, you might not need it, but a simple pattern like a factory is hardly any extra effort, and it will protect you against the whole family of potential future changes. Now, factory method is simple, but let's take a look at the code, and while we're there, I'll explain a little more about why we might want to enforce the use of a factory. So here's the very simple example. I have a class, student, with a couple of fields, and a public constructor in the normal way. I've also given it a two string so that we can actually see what it's doing. Then in a separate package, notice the need to import it, I have a client of this thing. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make several of these students uh, based on elements from a rather ugly parallel array of names and grades. Notice the grades are percentages. It seems no matter how I represent grades, they always confuse half of the planet. Um, so we're just going to go with that one. I add these individual students to my list uh, and then just print them out. Uh, the point, of course, is in real code, there might be lots of places where we construct these students. Uh, and at the moment, we're using the regular constructor form to do that. So just to make sure there's no surprises here, we run that one. And hopefully that's what you were expecting. What I want to imagine, though, now is that something happens in our requirements and we realize that we need a related and assignment compatible type. In this case, we're going to call this a VIP student. So we'll uncomment this one. 
And you'll see that in this case, a VIP student is assignment compatible with a student. It is a specialization. It is, in a rather ugly way, a subclass thereof. Uh, I prefer to avoid subclassing, but that makes this example fairly clear and easy. You'll notice the only specialized behavior is that it prints its name out in a different way so we can see what's going on. The notion here is that this is what we would use for students that have a higher grade, higher than 80% average in this case. If we have these constructors and we have this kind of code all over the place, the problem that we immediately encounter is that the client code is going to have to make a decision about which of these student types we need, whether we want the regular student or the VIP student. Now, it's not always inappropriate for a client to make a decision about exactly which type of something it wants, but it's often a very bad idea. It's spreading the knowledge and understanding of something that should be domain knowledge embedded in the student type or close to it. Uh, and it also means that we're going to be duplicating that decision-making logic across a great many potential places throughout our source code, and we might miss one. Anyway, what we would do is uh, we would embed in here the decision-making logic based on the grade. So we end up with logic like this. If the grade is greater than 80, we create a new VIP student. Otherwise, we create the regular student. And of course, this works perfectly well. The problem is this decision-making logic probably doesn't belong here and is going to potentially have to be duplicated in lots of places. We'll take that out now and we'll go back and we'll regenerate the student in a way that it forces the client to use a factory from the start. First step will be to make sure that the constructor is not accessible. Then we need to provide our factory. Factories are typically simply public static methods. The return type of this thing will be student. And while not required by this pattern, the method is often called of. If we were doing this in the very beginning, before we had any idea that we might need a subtype of this, we would simply say return new student. That, of course, means that our caller would never have been written to use the constructor in the first place because it's not accessible, but would instead have used the factory method. At this point, we see the code does the same as it did in the previous example when we just used the factory. What happens next, though, is that we go through that mental model of imagining that we suddenly decide we need a subtype, and that subtype needs to be created in specific situations, in our case that the grade is greater than 80. The decision-making logic here will be that we go into the factory and decide which of the two types to create. By the way, one other change I would have made is that the constructor in VIP student also would not be public. This would prevent the client from constructing one of these directly. So now our logic for deciding which type to make is going to be embedded in this factory in one place and hopefully in the one place we would look for it since it is considered, in our example at least, to be business logic related directly to the student. The client won't need to know about this. Now that we have that logic, and our client code was using the factory, we find that the client code gets the right type without any changes required, and also without any special embedded behavior in the client code. An important point to realize here is that if client code can access a constructor directly, it can end up in a situation where you'll need to make extensive changes to enforce the use of the factory later. But if you start with a factory or a builder or similar pattern, then you know that no client code can have called that non-public, non-accessible constructor in the first place, and you don't have to go looking for other places that you need to make a change. One observation to ponder is that I did not make this constructor private. There are ways you can go about making these constructors outright private, but it's probably sufficient to give them package or possibly um, protected access and ensure that they are limited in their accessibility. If you want them to be private, you can do it, but you have to work a little harder. So, the example illustrates potential benefits for avoiding accessible constructors in the situation where you later decide you need subtypes and you want the client not to have to make decisions about which of those types it needs.
But don't forget the possibility of pooling too. If you're using immutable data, which is probably an increasingly common way of doing things for reliability, that can be a huge benefit as well. The idea of pooling for use with immutable data types can actually help enormously with memory if you have lots of duplicates of the same essential value of object. Notice this idea also applies to what I typically call runtime enums, or might otherwise be referred to as a form of flyweight. Now, implementation inheritance is generally accepted to be bad, and I'm inclined to agree with that. But it's still relevant if we have this kind of pattern using interfaces. And now, of course, we can have static factories in interfaces for this same reason. And again, notice how many more of the modern APIs in Java use this approach. For example, the entire package java.time.